Napoleon is the figure in modern history that came closest to fully unifying Europe somewhat permanently. Sure, the world war saw some attempts, but these were short lived and doomed to fail. Napoleon though, in 1806, had pretty much solidified control over Europe by conquest and alliance. But from this position, he got arrogant. He attempted to usurp the Spanish crown for his brother, leading to a devastating guerrilla war against the Portuguese, Spanish and British. He also had an alliance and friendship with Alexander I of Russia, but when Russia started trading with the British, Napoleon decided to invade the nation. This invasion of Russia proved to be disastrous. Napoleon entered with around 450,000 soldiers. By the time he retreated, he only had 100,000 left. This was obviously a devastating military loss, but perhaps even more importantly was the moral damage done to Napoleon and his allies. France had defeated Austria and Prussia in multiple wars, forcing them into an alliance with him, but they were still fully sovereign states. With Russia's defeat over Napoleon, Napoleon lost these alliances, and first Prussia and then later Austria joined against Napoleon. And thus, the sixth coalition against Napoleon was formed. Britain, Russia, Spain and Portugal had already been at war with Napoleon, but thanks to Napoleon's actions, Sweden now decided to also side with the coalition, and following the disaster in Russia, Prussian generals decided to stop fighting the Russians, after which Prussia fully switched sides against Napoleon. Austria's alliance with France had also ended, and soon, Austria too would rejoin the coalition. The final coalition that would take down Napoleon had now been formed. And from all sides, the newfound allies began to advance on Paris from all sides, and Napoleon's situation became truly drastic. He just didn't have the troops to fight against the major powers in Spain and Central Europe. Any soldier pulled away from either front would just mean that the other could begin to push further. Napoleon's collapse became near inevitable at the Battle of Leipzig, or, how it's more epically known, the Battle of the Nations. In this battle, Napoleon attempted to defend the position of Leipzig in Saxony with about 190,000 troops. The combined coalition forces attacking the position outnumbered the French more than 2 to 1. After Napoleon decisively lost the battle, he retreated over the Rhine, and his presence east of the Rhine was permanently destroyed. But now, the coalition had to ask themselves, what's next? Total victory was by no means guaranteed, and only time could tell how much more money and men would need to be spent to fully capitulate France. Despite all of France's issues, Napoleon was still Napoleon after all. All sides were tired of war, and Napoleon's continental hegemony had now been broken. Perhaps some negotiations were not possible. Led by the Austrian diplomat Clemens von Metternich, a treaty was drafted at Frankfurt. France would have to pull back from the Netherlands, Germany east of the Rhine, Italy up to the Alps, and Spain up to the Pyrenees. While territorially a major defeat, Napoleon would still be allowed to remain the Emperor of France, and France would still have gained a massive amount of land, achieving the natural borders of France. But Napoleon, being Napoleon, still believed that he could turn the tides of the war in his favour. He lost the opportunity to accept the peace deal as Austria and Britain discussed the peace offer again and the offer was repealed. When the coalition then began to push into France and Napoleon was getting more and more desperate, he attempted to surrender to the terms of the Frankfurt proposals, but by this point the Allied terms had gotten harsher than Napoleon was willing to accept. The war finally concluded with the coalition marching into Paris and the abdication of Napoleon. But what if this changed? What if, in an alternate scenario, Napoleon had realized that after Leipzig, his goals of continental hegemony would be impossible to accomplish? Napoleon had revolutionized warfare, which was what allowed him to reach his position of dominance in the first place. Napoleon implemented fast-paced mobile warfare as well as mass mobilization. Napoleon had changed how warfare would be conducted forever by proving just how effective his innovations were. But at the start of the war, it was just Napoleon using these tactics. But by now, his enemies had caught up. Napoleon was no longer unique in his tactics. And while it can be argued that Napoleon was still the superior general to his opponents, all his opponents had to do now was just to push on multiple fronts. And since Napoleon cannot be everywhere, there is no way he could defeat all of his opponents. Even if he managed to push back one or two of the great powers that was marching to Paris, the others could simply continue their steady progress elsewhere. Had Napoleon realized just how bad his position was in 1813, he would have realized that the Frankfurt proposals were the best that he could hope for. Now, if we're being fully realistic, we immediately reach an issue with this proposal that needs to be discussed. The British government was not behind the peace deal as discussed at Frankfurt. From the very beginning, 
Britain had declared Napoleon's emperorship illegitimate and all the border changes that came with it. At Frankfurt, Britain's delegate Lord Aberdeen had misunderstood the aims of London in the war, leading to him signing off on the Frankfurt proposal. But when the Earl of Liverpool, the British Prime Minister, heard of these terms, he wasn't happy, leading to him in our timeline rediscussing the terms with Austria and the offer being repealed. Still though, if we assume that Prussia, Russia and Austria all got behind Metternich's peace treaty of Frankfurt, there would be little that Britain could do to change their minds. Britain has the option to continue the war against Napoleon in a 1v1, but it's also very well possible that Britain decides to at least temporarily accept this new peace deal. So we'll have it so that by 1813 Napoleon accepts and the new French borders are finalized. Europe would breathe a giant sigh of relief, while Britain would be angry on their island and Napoleon would be disappointed in how his empire could have suddenly collapsed this hard. The people of Europe, as well as the nations of Spain, Austria, Prussia and Russia would be glad that the devastating conflict was now finally over. So the big question now is, what happens next? Very frustratingly for Napoleon, he would be largely left out of discussions as Europe decides what to do with the rest of the continent. One of the most important goals for the other nations would be to contain renewed French aggression. This would lead to the restoration of many Italian states under direct or indirect Austrian protection. Sardinia Piedmont would be expanded into the Genoan coastline as well. In Germany, Hanover would be restored to British rulership and Prussia would be expanded into the east bank of the Rhine to protect against future French aggression, while also gaining lands in central Germany. The remaining German states would be restored under joint Prussian and Austrian protection to prevent future French or Russian aggression. Poland would be divided between Prussia and Russia, with Russia gaining most of it. In our timeline, the end of the war would see a quite stable diplomatic and political climate being created in Europe. France had been reduced to its pre-war borders, being thrown out of most non-French regions. Prussia was beefed up into a significant power, the Netherlands and Sardinia Piedmont stood between future French aggression, and Austria created a massive web of influence protecting the smaller Central European states against future aggression. Meanwhile, Napoleon had been deposed, liberalism had suffered a symbolic defeat, and monarchies were restored across Europe. In contrast, this alternate timeline would see a smaller Prussia, Netherlands and Sardinia Piedmont and none of them would be capable of standing up to the French. France also owns a significant amount of land where non-French speakers live. Despite Napoleon's defeat, France remains the strongest nation on the European continent, led by the same Napoleon that had fought and humiliated the other powers time and time again in the previous decade. Knowing Napoleon, it is very likely that this peace only lasts for a couple of years as Napoleon regroups and decides to try a new offensive. If Napoleon were to get even one of the other great powers on his side, he even has a good chance of at least short-term success in this new round of conflict. Meanwhile, Napoleon's emperorship is now legitimized by the other great powers, which is a big symbolic win for his liberal ideology. So, the big question of this alternate timeline is very simple. Can Napoleon accept the new status quo? Britain would likely want to resume conflict with the French, but if Napoleon was serious about accepting these new borders, Britain wouldn't have the justification, morale or allies to do so. All eyes would be on Napoleon for the first decades following the Peace of Frankfurt. If Napoleon tries anything, you can be sure that Britain, Austria and Prussia at the very least unite against him. This new war would be a major gamble for Napoleon and unless he gets Russia on his side, this attempt would probably be doomed from the start. But of course, just because it's a gamble doesn't mean that Napoleon wouldn't want to attempt it. Europe would be on edge and one missed move by France or even Russia could restart a massive chain of wars. For the sake of this scenario though, we are going with the idea that Napoleon, following the Battle of Leipzig, reluctantly accepts the difficulty of his position. The people of France are tired of war. Up to 20% of the young male population had died, the other great powers would likely be united to remove renewed aggression from Napoleon, and France had already achieved its natural borders. We will assume that Napoleon finally gives up on conquest and focuses on ruling. What would a mostly peaceful Napoleon look like? The initial issue Napoleon would need to address is his legitimacy. He used to rule the entire continent and after his final humiliating defeat, there would be questions regarding the continuation of his rule. But I have full confidence that Napoleon would manage just fine. He can still claim a partial victory as France has still achieved great territorial expansion under his rule and thanks to his reforms, Napoleon was also still quite popular internally, as shown by his return to power from our own timeline. 
And with the war now over, the population finally has the time to recover from the discontent that came with constant war. One military defeat that leaves France with their natural boundaries would not be enough to delegitimize Napoleon. So we need to now wonder what Napoleon's diplomacy may look like. Despite his dislike of the old noble houses of Europe, he would finally need to integrate into the old Game of Thrones. Napoleon would be married to the daughter of the Austrian Emperor, giving an avenue of cooled Austro-French relations. Metternich, the architect of the Frankfurt proposals, would welcome a positive Austro-French relationship as well. Austria would be the key nation Napoleon needs to keep on his side to prevent a new coalition of states declaring war against him. One of the main reasons why Metternich allowed Napoleon the pretty generous Frankfurt peace deal was because Metternich feared the rise of Prussia, the global dominance of Britain and the sheer size and potential of Russia. For Metternich, and thus in large part for Austria, being close to a Napoleon that has given up on continental hegemony gives them a very nice ally to stop Russian attempts at continental hegemony. Apart from Austria, Napoleon would likely also manage to find somewhat of a close relationship with Alexander I of Russia. But Napoleon himself would likely not ever find much sympathy from Spain, which was devastated by the Peninsula War, Prussia, which was humiliated, divided and envious of French control over the Rhine, or Britain, which is still mad about Napoleon being allowed to remain in power with such a large nation intact. While this alternate balance of power would be nowhere near as solid as our timeline following the fall of Napoleon, I do certainly consider this situation to be somewhat stable, at least for a little while. France and Russia are the only two nations that really threaten the balance, but neither France nor Russia would want to see the other one expand rapidly either, while Britain and Austria would intervene against either nation's attempts at expansion. As long as France or Russia don't strike a full alliance, which I do consider unlikely, sustained peace is possible in the near future. So with foreign policy done, let's now look at how Napoleon would rule France and I only have one simple conclusion, extremely well. Napoleon was most well known for his military talents but he also was a great administrator and organizer. Apart from this, France has also been expanded into some of the most important economic regions of Europe for the industrial revolution to come in Belgium and the Rhineland. Apart from Britain and certain areas of the United States, these were some of the most industrialized areas in the world with an abundance of coal and iron. While it is unclear what Napoleon's attitude would be towards industrialization, I consider it likely that even if he doesn't help ensure its growth, then at the very least Napoleon wouldn't oppose it. Furthermore, Napoleon would continue to rule France with a mix of liberalism and absolutism. He would remain in power as a near sole ruler, but the way he did it was an extreme version of the enlightened monarchies of old. He was a patron of education, offering and standardizing education across France. His legal code is famed to this very day as the basis for the Western legal system, and despite remaining a mostly absolutist monarchy during his reign, Napoleon would build France into one of the most advanced nations of the time. This alternate France would be like a larger Prussia of our own timeline. Despite being an autocracy ruled by a single monarch, education, limited meritocracy and industrialization would be encouraged. But Napoleon couldn't enjoy his tenure as peacetime ruler for a long time. In 1821, give or take a few years, Napoleon would die from stomach cancer. It has been claimed that it was not illness that took Napoleon, but deliberate poisoning by the British via arsenic. A lot of arsenic was found in his remains and his body remained strangely well preserved decades after passing away. Arsenic, as a strong preserver, has that effect on dead bodies. Further research, however, has proven that Napoleon, even as a young boy, had extreme amounts of arsenic in his body, as was relatively common in that time period. Britain did not poison Napoleon, meaning that natural causes would still take him around the same time. If we want to, we can push back the year of his death a couple of years since Napoleonic France would have better medical technology than Saint Helena, but before 1825, Napoleon would pass away. He would be succeeded by his teenage boy, Napoleon Bonaparte II. In our timeline, he had only lived until the age of 21, so we know relatively little about the boy. Not to mention that he only had the first four years of his life with his father, after which Napoleon was exiled and Napoleon II was moved to Vienna. This means that it's difficult to say how this alternate boy would develop. What is clear, however, is that he was a bright young boy. He was tall, charismatic, serious and intelligent. He had a passion for the military, much like his father. While it's impossible to say for certain, I would put my money on Napoleon II being a capable ruler as well, especially after being tutored under the care of his father. 
But again, specifics are very difficult to tell. Especially since in our timeline, Napoleon II had died in 1832 at the age of 21. It is very well possible that he survives in this alternate timeline, but we cannot say for certain. Furthermore, it is impossible to say what his personal beliefs would be. He would surely be influenced by his father, but would he directly copy his father's work or put his own spin on it? Would he be a conservative, an absolutist, a staunch liberal? We cannot say. For that reason, we are now returning to the map of Europe and we will no longer be talking in specifics, instead talking about the broad potential future of the map of Europe and the world. Because ever since the peace deal in 1813, much has changed across the world. To start off with, we have Spain, where the Bourbons would be restored to power. Spain would remain one of the harshest anti-Napoleon nations in Europe, but luckily for France, they weren't much of a threat. Spain may look massive on the map thanks to their American holdings, but the massive Spanish Empire had already started to crumble, as loyalists didn't recognize Napoleon's takeover of power, and revolutionaries seized their chances to declare independence regardless of who sat in Madrid. While the dust is yet to settle on the Latin American wars of independence, fact is that Britain doesn't care too much about the collapse of the Spanish Empire, seeing it as an opportunity to economically dominate the area. While Spain itself is in no position to reverse it after years of warfare and the lack of a navy to combat the revolutions. The Spanish Empire, for the most part, still falls. Then we have Africa. I will not go into too much detail, but especially Northern Africa seems like a ripe area for French expansion. Europe was in diplomatic gridlock and French actions there would surely result in a larger war. But the only serious contender for North Africa was the weak Spain. Elsewhere, the British would likely still take most of the previously Dutch colonies in Africa. While it may lead to some international criticism at Britain, if we look over at Europe, the hilariously small reformed Dutch state is in no position to defend themselves against future French or Prussian aggression. Giving the Netherlands significant colonies back would be risking these colonies getting into French hands in the future. In Asia, it's much the same story. The Dutch wouldn't hold Indonesia. For the same reasons that I mentioned before, the Dutch simply cannot protect themselves against French or even Prussian attacks. With Britain in constant fear of France or Russia attempting to secure dominance in Europe, the Brits would need to push their global advantage. Returning the significant Indonesian colonies back to the Dutch rump state would risk them falling into the hands of Napoleonic France in the future. This is not a risk that Britain would be willing to take. Then finally, we have Europe, where I cannot make any hard predictions. Even if we assume peace between the great power lasts, the situation is extremely tense. The double threat of Russia and France, and the ambitions of their rulers, weigh heavily upon Central Europe. Russian expansion into the Ottomans would be just as terrifying as French aggression into Italy. Any diplomatic misstep by any of the great powers, but specifically France and Russia, would cause a massive war to erupt again. One of the more interesting players to watch in this balance of power would be Prussia. Inherently opposed to Austria as competitors to power in Germany, but also opposed to French control over the Rhineland, and afraid of the sheer potential of Russia. Realistically, Prussia can go with any of the other great powers, whichever offers them the most and gets them closer to building up a seriously strong position. Western Europe would be mostly stable thanks to the diplomatic efforts of Austria. The small Dutch Republic would be guaranteed by Prussia, Austria and Britain. The German states would be guaranteed by Austria and Prussia. And Italy would be guaranteed by just Austria. Any move made by France against any of their neighbors would likely trigger war with Austria, bringing in Britain as well. The most significant disruptor to peace in Western Europe is the crisis zone of the Rhineland, which is making relations between France and German-speaking people on both sides of the Rhine more difficult. But where Western Europe is relatively stable thanks to the Austrian, British encirclement of France, I foresee greater trouble coming from Eastern Europe. The Ottoman Empire is still in steady decline, and it provides great opportunity for conflict as Russia, Austria or even Britain and France attempt to make use of the declining empire to break the European stalemate in their favor. Otherwise, there is also still the potential of liberal revolutions across Europe. The Treaty of Frankfurt saved Napoleon and thereby his ideology, and the well-being of the mixed liberal autocratic France would influence liberals across Europe. It is impossible to say when and how revolutions would take place, with Germans calling for unification in the Rhineland, Italians calling for unification in general, Hungarians calling for independence, and liberals calling for reforms across Europe, any significant revolution in any of the significant nations could be enough to see the whole house of cards of European diplomacy tumbling down. 
So realistically, I cannot predict any further as there are just too many uncertainties. So anything I say from this point is not a full prediction. But just for fun, let's look at one potential future of Europe. I think the weakest link in this new balance of power remains the Austrian Empire. They are so extremely vital to protecting the entire balance of power in Italy and Germany that they are the one power that absolutely cannot ever find itself weakened or the entire balance of power may collapse. Sadly, the Austrian Empire is by far the most unstable great power. They have a major issue with the Hungarians, who have a large degree of autonomy and will likely, at some point, attempt to assert their independence from Vienna. Meanwhile in France, either Napoleon II or some other relative of Napoleon is now in charge, and they will certainly want to prove themselves. Napoleon had pushed France to the edges of Europe, keeping at least the natural boundaries of France after all of his conquests. Their successors couldn't just not wage war. They had to prove that they were a Bonaparte too. My prediction would be that this entire balance of power comes tumbling down after a Hungarian revolt. When exactly this revolt would take place is impossible to say, but that this revolt would break Europe is very likely. And it shows the real difference between this scenario and our own timeline. In our timeline, the more comprehensive peace deal also included an agreement that all other powers were monarchies now and they would help each other against revolutions. This included Russia in 1848, helping Austria put down a Hungarian revolt. It is very possible that this alternate timeline's Austria, who is blocking Russian and French expansion everywhere, doesn't get the same kind of help. At the same time, if we're following our own timeline's model of events, Italian revolutionaries would call for independence from Austria at the exact same time. I would predict that Napoleon II would use this opportunity to break the European stalemate. By joining the war on the side of the Italians, he wouldn't necessarily be expanding France directly, meaning that there is a chance that other nations don't instantly get involved, but after helping the Italians and Hungarians break away, Austria as a superpower is no more. From here, the balance of power unravels. Britain is powerful, but Britain's main strength is on the seas. Britain is often seen as some super hegemon in this time period, but their strength came from the diplomatic gridlock in Europe itself which ensured that Europe was too busy arguing among themselves to stand up to Britain. Britain, by themselves, cannot necessarily defeat France or Russia in a land war. As balance now appears to be lost, Russia would strike into the Ottomans, the panicked German miners would gather behind Prussia to prevent them from falling to renewed French offensives, and Austria would unravel further. At this point, I would guess that Prussia decides to gather behind Russia. Prussia has little to gain by opposing Russia, it would just make Prussia the front line in the coming Great War. And the Great War that I would predict is France, with their newly created Italian puppet, and the Ottomans, against Russia and Prussia. Britain is the wild card, and I will leave it up to you all in the comments which side Britain would support. If Britain supports the Russian side, then France would surely collapse. France would be mutilated, Prussia would form into a new Germany, possibly even including Austria as well, while in the meantime, Russia would restructure the Balkans into a web of puppet regimes. The new world order would see Germany, Russia and Britain, three absolute giants, competing in a massive race for power. If Britain instead supports France, we would see the Franco-British alliance come out on top. Italy would be expanded, France would likely revive some form of a German puppet regime, while Russia would be pushed back by the Ottomans and be forced to release regions like Poland, but remain intact. Much like during the Napoleonic Wars, France does not have the strength to capitulate Russia all the way, and Britain would only have joined to contain Russia, but helping France fully capitulate Russia would just be giving all of Europe to France. In this ending, it's France, Britain and Russia that will be competing for influence. And that's where I'll end this scenario. Let me know in the comments where you think both endings go from here, and if you even agree with the two possible endings I have painted here. If you enjoyed the content, consider subscribing for at least one more alternate history video every single week. To help the video grow, consider leaving a like and a comment. It really does help out against the algorithm. Even just commenting something simple like hi helps the video out massively. Again, thank you all for watching, and a special thanks to these patrons who help me dedicate more time and effort to the channel by supporting me monetarily. To help the channel and get early access to videos whenever I complete them myself, consider supporting me there. Once more, thank you all for watching and goodbye.